Hello everyone. We are going to do a screencast lecture for the last section of this unit over Mesopotamia and um, Egypt. We have several different um, civilizations that we need to look at, including today the Chaldeans, the Phoenicians, and then a little bit deeper emphasis on the Persians and the Hebrew civilizations. So this is going to be a little bit longer screencast. I'm going to put them all together, but you can watch them um, in individual chunks if it gets a little bit long to view at one time. But also, this would be good review for your unit test. The first civilization that we're going to quickly review over, I just have a few items here related to the Chaldeans. Um, we've discussed this group before. Um, also seen a little bit of documentary footage related to them on the um, the Lost Civilizations video that we've been watching. The Chaldeans, I often refer to them as Babylonians. A Babylonian um, people um, are kind of referenced to both the Amorites, who we've talked about before, um, Hammurabi's um, empire, but mainly the Chaldeans are referred to as Babylonians because of Babylon being their main city. Their key ruler was a ruler by the name of Nebuchadnezzar, um, really restructured Babylon, made it into kind of a shining example of early cities in the Mesopotamian region. And one of the things that um, Nebuchadnezzar is particularly noted for is his um, construction of the hanging gardens of Babylon that um, were built for his wife, who he had um, brought to the country from the land of Medea. And it said that she was very... Um, homesick, and as a result, in order to kind of make her feel at home, that Nebuchadnezzar constructed this um, kind of mountain-like garden structure for her to remind her of the mountains of home. This is, of course, an artist's rendition of the Hanging Gardens. Uh, they are one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, as identified by the Greeks, but the Hanging Gardens don't exist any longer. There is um, some historical um, um, idea that potentially the Hanging Gardens were not even in Babylon itself, but maybe actually in the city of Nineveh and had been constructed by the Assyrians. But they are still kind of connected to the idea of Babylon, I think, by most references that you see. But I have read some literature that indicates some historians think that they may have been in another location. The empire of the Babylonians was extensive. You can see here that it covers this full area of the Fertile Crescent. Again, not as not over into Egypt as other um, empires had done. But you can see the extent here and the main cities. You can see where Babylon is located right here in the center of the um, Tigris-Euphrates River Valley. The um, city of Babylon has been one of the major archaeological sites that have been um, uh, um, excavated in uh, Mesopotamia. These are some of the um, locations that are most famous. The um, city was dedicated to the god, the god Marduk, um, also known as Baal. Um, he is one of the key gods of the Mesopotamian region. But also there's some other gods and goddesses that are referenced in terms of the architecture. One of the main entrances into the cities, as depicted here in this artist's rendition, is the Ishtar, Day, is the Ishtar Gate. Um, this is the Ishtar Gate today that has been um, disassembled and um, taken to um, Germany. It's actually in a museum, I think, in Dresden, Germany. And you can see the size of the structure. This portion here is like this portion over here in the artist's rendition. So you can see kind of the scale with the um, small people in the artist's um, depiction here. And you can see the size of the people, of course, in this picture in the museum. So it's quite an impressive structure. And there were multiple gates that went into the city of Babylon, but this was one that was kind of the most majestic, I guess you would say. This is um, the goddess Ishtar who the Ishtar Gate was dedicated to, and there was a temple of Ishtar also within uh, Babylon. Ishtar is um, kind of a connected goddess, I think, to like Venus and Aphrodite, if you're familiar with the uh, Greek and Roman um, mythology and the goddess of love. And these are just some of the um, 
sculptures, relief sculptures that would have um, been adorning the Ishtar Gate itself. So one of the famous architectural structures of the city. Um, this would be one of those items that might show up on an extra credit um, art history test that we would um, take here later on. These are other images of Babylon today, um, different sites for, that have been ex excavated um, associated with the Babylonians. And a lot of this excavation was done um, during the 1980s and 1990s when Saddam Hussein was in power in um, modern-day Iraq, which is where Babylon was located. And he kind of uh, modeled himself as like the new Nebuchadnezzar trying to rebuild um, Iraq's ancient greatness. And I know that he even had um, statues of Nebuchadnezzar constructed where he had his head kind of modeled as the um, image of Nebuchadnezzar's face, but it was really Saddam Hussein's face. So an interesting, maybe modern connection, but um, certainly Iraq is the center of where civilization is really beginning. So they have a lot of um, cultural history that goes back thousands and thousands of, of years. The um, other civilizations that we have that we haven't discussed um, very much, I have a couple of them here mentioned on this slide. Um, first of all, the Phoenicians. I wanted to mention the Phoenicians because we've discussed them in, in the past. You may not remember, but one of the great um, contributions of the Phoenicians is their um, creation of a written alphabet. And in fact, our alphabet today is based off of the Phoenician alphabet and the reason why an alphabet is called an alphabet is because of the first two letters of the Phoenician alphabet, which were Aleph and Bet. Um, they're words for house and ox, and or excuse me, I should say ox and house. Um, Aleph is ox and Bet is house. And if you see like on the way, you might think, what is this a house? This is supposed to be like a um, kind of a symbolic structure of say like a tent home uh, with kind of a doorway opening in it and then ox you can maybe see a stylized version of an animal um, cattle with this is like an ox's horns um, this third letter in the um, alphabet is gimel which is the hump of a camel so you can kind of hear how camel and gimel sound the same um, so you can see some of the connections to ancient letters and then modern day letters as they developed. Um, so the Phoenicians were the first to create an alphabet and I think probably the reason why it came from the Phoenicians is that they had an extensive trading system that they had developed throughout the Mediterranean even as far they believe as up into Britain possibly and they had great trading centers. They were continually in contact with other civilizations and as a result I'm they wanted to develop a method of communication that would work well between different groups. And so the idea of a written language that could um, symbolically take sounds and form them into letters was probably of a great advantage to them. The, the um, other civilization in this area that kind of connected to this trading aspect was a group known as the Lydians. And the Lydians had um, another major contribution that came about that, in, that influenced trade quite a bit, and that was the use of coined money, and this is an ancient Lydian coin from that time period. So trade had a lot to do with the extension of ideas from civilization to civilization, and certainly the Phoenicians were a big part of that. This is a map, or excuse me, I'm going to jump ahead. This is a map that um, shows um, the areas of the um, Phoenician um, trading empire, um, Tyre and Sidon, their two main cities over here, which would be in modern day Lebanon. And then they extended out to the areas in North Africa, which is eventually known as the uh, Empire of Carthage. There's a famous story of a princess by the name of Dido, who was um, exiled basically out of Lebanon, and she led her people and followers to Carthage, and they established an area there that became a major empire of its own. Eventually we'll talk about Carthage more because they will be main competitors of the Romans. They extended over into the island of Sicily here and um, they fought the Romans through a long series of wars that are known as the Punic Wars. The Latin word for uh, Phoenician was the word Punic 
And so we'll come back to a discussion of these Phoenicians at a later time. But the map doesn't indicate it, but there is some evidence that they had um, trading colonies established all the way up here, which would be on the island of, um, of Great Britain, which is not shown on this map. But certainly a very extensive trading empire. One of the things the Phoenicians were well known for in terms of trade was their um, access to um, tall cedar trees, which used to grow all through large forests in Lebanon. Now, most of those forests are all gone today, although these are modern pictures of some of the um, cedar trees in the region. But the cedar tree was very significant because the Middle East doesn't have a lot of other tall, um, straight um, trees with, um, with harder wood, although the cedar is not a real hardwood tree. It's um, softer. But if you look at the other woods of the region, you have olive trees and you have palm trees. And those trees, neither one, are, are good for um, large construction. So these trees were harvested and used for the construction of ships. They also became like major architectural elements in a lot of the buildings of the region because they could make big long beams out of them. And there's several references like in the Old Testament of the Bible to the um, structure of, of buildings and temples made with um, the timbers that came from these tall cedar trees of Lebanon that were controlled by the Phoenicians. So that was a big part of the economic output of that region as well. The other um, civilization that I wanted to quickly look at, and it's you're going to have a um, documentary that we'll watch in class related to this, is the Empire of Persia. Um, the Persians are potentially the largest empire that the world has known. You could arguably say maybe the Mongols later on were a little bit larger, but they, the Mongols don't really quite fit always the definition of, of empire. We might talk about them at a later time, but certainly they had an extensive region that controlled um, all the areas of the Fertile Crescent um, at a later time. You can see the years that we're looking at here. This is from 539 to 331 BC, a couple hundred year time period. The, um, or, yeah, excuse me, the um, 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 Persians initially were from an area around the Black Sea. They spoke an Indo European form of language. And eventually, the dynasty that emerged as the strongest is the Achaemenid dynasty. And there's three great leaders that come out of this that are worth discussing. Um, one is Cyrus, known as Cyrus the Great. And then the other two, Darius and Xerxes, um, who we will discuss at a later time, probably more when we get into our section over Greece, because these are the um, Achaemenid um, um, emperors that um, engaged in several wars with the Greeks that were very significant for the development of Western civilization and what happened um, at a later period of time. The um, uh, Persians are known for a lot of contributions to the ideas of government and to the organizations of, of governments and the control of, of um, territory. They're really, really highly organized. And one of the things that they did that was so significant is that when they conquered areas, they incorporated those civilizations or peoples that they conquered into the Persian Empire. The idea that the Persians had was that you could become Persian. You didn't have to be born as a Persian. You could be incorporated into their system if you had the skills and talents necessary that um, the empire needed. And so as a result, they had kind of an equality-driven idea in that respect where people could rise up through levels of government if they had the skills necessary. You weren't just automatically excluded as a conquered people. So that was very significant with their government organization, and many conquered people ended up becoming you know, key elements of the um, Persian um, government system. They're also really well noted for their extension of power through road construction, uh, being able to have their military travel quickly through the empire, and also for information to travel quickly as well. Um, the leader, who's known as Cyrus the Great, he's also known for some other kind of uh, 
I guess I would say, kind of revolutionary ideas. One of the things that Cyrus is famous for is that he is one of the few or maybe even the only one that we know in the ancient world who, as a ruler, refused to enslave the people that he conquered. Um, enslavement was just kind of the, you know, the rule of the day during the time. If you were conquered by someone stronger, then there was probably a pretty good chance that you would be um, sold into slavery. Cyrus refused to do that. He basically kind of this idea of incorporation of people into the empire and, you know, have them. It wasn't that people were, you know, given the options of joining the Persians, but there's a difference between being conquered and incorporated into the new ruling order versus being conquered and enslaved and being forced to work or serve others um, unwillingly. So there's a, a real strong component of kind of a equality-driven idea that comes out during the time of Cyrus. This is a map showing the extent of the Persian Empire. You can see how it's much, much larger than the previous empires we've been seeing. You know, this is the area of the Fertile Crescent right through here. All the other empires that we've discussed in this section have just ruled in this area. But if you notice, you see the um, Persian Empire extending all the way into what is today modern-day Iran. Uh, modern-day Iran used to be known as, as the nation of Persia. It was renamed Iran in the 1950s, I believe, about 1954, 55. And you can see that the Persian Empire extends all the way over to this area where the Indus River is. We'll look at the area of the Indus in our next unit. And then all the way over into um, Europe across the Bosporus and the Dardanelles Straits here and into areas of, of Macedonia and Thrace. These are the areas where the Persians came in conflict with the Greeks later on. As I mentioned, we'll talk about that at a later time. But certainly an extensive empire, larger than any of the other empires that we've discussed, and like I said, larger maybe than any empire the world has ever known. Um, a lot of key cities, um, Parsergad, um, Persepolis, um, capital cities here um, at different times, and um, there's a lot of these sites that have been excavated over the years. Most of these major cities were uh, ruined cities now, but there's been a lot of archaeological exca excavation. So the, the land of Persia kind of corresponds to modern-day Iran. The Iranian people today are the descendants of the Persians, just like the Iraqi people are, many of them descendants of the uh, Babylonian people. The other ideas that are connected to Persia that I want to mention are religious ideas. I'm just going to put all this up here. They followed a religion that was um, created by a teacher by the name of Zoroaster, and it's referred to as Zoroastrianism. And I wanted to mention it because in this next section, we're getting into ideas of monotheism. And the Persians had very um, strong ideas of monotheistic beliefs in the Zoroastrianism belief system. There are not very many Zoroastrians left in the world today. I think maybe just a few thousand um, and so it's, it's, an, it's a religion that has died off. But if you look at the belief systems, these ideas of a single God, these ideas of a spiritual struggle between good and evil, the ideas of punishment or reward based on your choice as a human, and that all of this is very similar to like the ideas of Judaism and Christianity that develops and it's believed that Zoroastrianism in the region had quite a bit of influence on, especially like Christian ideas. If you look at it, you can see a real strong root in there. Um, there's a final judgment um, kind of battle that will take place, which is very similar to the ideas of Christianity, that there will be an apocalyptic battle that will um, end the world and um, good will triumph, um, evil will be destroyed and, and the world may be destroyed in the, um, in the um, event itself. But the idea I wanted to mention is, is significant when you see this idea of monotheism developing in the Middle East um, as kind of a unique um, concept. We have, of course, already talked about um, Akhenaten, who developed the idea of monotheism within, within uh, Egypt. 
So you can see the idea is also developing in other cultures. So in line with that and the ideas of monotheism, I wanted to now move into the ideas of the Hebrew civilization. A little bit of background on the Hebrew people. Um, there's a lot of, of stories about the Hebrews that are related in other documents, but the main stories of the Hebrew civilization is based on the stories of the Old Testament of the Bible. Um, we, there's a lot of, of history connected, of course, to the Hebrews. Um, and one of the things I wanted to kind of mention is the background that's connected to their concept of land ownership and control in the area where they ended up developing their kingdoms that they ruled in. Um, the Hebrew belief system goes back to approximately 1700 um, BC, um, a little bit earlier than that, maybe 1800 BC. It's not the oldest religion in the world. Um, Hinduism does go back in a more ancient time, but it is definitely the second oldest um, religion in the world and the oldest of all the monotheistic religions. If you look at the Old Testament, the Bible, you will see a couple different things here. I want to show you on this next map. Let me go to this idea and then we'll come back. The, the founder of, he, of the Hebrew belief and the founders of Judaism are based on the ideas of this person, um, the man known as Abraham historically. And the story is, is that Abraham um, was a um, leader of a nomadic people. Um, there's some legendary reference that he was maybe from around the area of Ur, which is the oldest city in the world located down here in the area of Sumer. But there's also references to him living in this area of Haran up here in the north. And that Abraham um, developed a belief in a single god and the single God, which is known as Yahweh or Jehovah or just God in the, in the Hebrew and, and Christian tradition, that in order to reward Abraham for you know, professing this belief in him as a single God and worshiping only him, that God rewarded Abraham with um, a land um, kind of exclusively for the Hebrew people here in this region of the uh, Fertile Crescent, which is known as the land of Canaan, C-A-N-A-A-N. So in the time of Abraham, Abraham's people migrated to this area and they established um, settlements here. But over time, the Hebrew people experienced like a, believed like a period of famine that drove them into the land of Egypt. And that story is told um, in the Old Testament of the Bible, in the uh, stories of Joseph. And then, of course, as the Hebrew people lived in Egypt, the stories of Moses and um, the, um, as the Hebrews call it, the enslavement of the, of the Hebrew Jewish people by the Egyptians. Um, there's all sorts of different stories that are connected to this, but ultimately, um, eventually, the Hebrew people are going to rise up against the, against the Pharaonic rulers and leave the area of Egypt and travel back out of Egypt down here, back to the land of Canaan. And all these stories um, are depicted in the um, second um, book of the Old Testament of the Bible, the book of Exodus. The, the books of the Bible in the Old Testament, um, the first five books of the Bible of the Old Testament are known as um, the um, um, Pentateuch, um, the first penta, penta meaning five, uh, the books of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And those are the books that kind of lay out the, the origins, the background history of the, of the Hebrew people and the development of their original belief system. When the um, Hebrews get back to the area of Canaan where they had not lived for years, they waged war against the tribes that had moved in here, all the different groups that they referred to as the Canaanites, multiple tribes that they fought. And eventually, they take back control of the region and they select kings to rule over them. They're originally ruled by priests, but then they uh, moved to the idea of king rulership 
and their first king that they um, uh, put into power was the King Saul. And then they replaced King Saul, who, according to the stories, fell out of favor with both the Hebrews and God. And they replaced him with the young King David. And one of David's sons was the son Solomon. And these became three of the very prominent early rulers of the um, Jewish people. The city of Jerusalem was established by their capital, uh, or as their capital. Um, Jerusalem is the longest continuously inhabited city in the world. And there have been people living there for more than 3,000 years. And when they established their, their um, uh, kingdom there, they were dealing with a lot of outside um, civilizations that were very strong. And eventually, by 722 BC, they were attacked by the Assyrians, who we've discussed before, and their military capabilities. The Assyrians very nearly um, destroyed the Hebrews, but the Hebrews survived. However, in 587 BC, a couple hundred years later, the Chaldeans, led by Nebuchadnezzar, are going to conquer the Hebrews. Um, they burn down the city of Jerusalem, and they take captive um, 10, 12,000 Jewish kind of intellectuals, big leaders, all the um, kind of the political leaders, the religious leaders, and they took them back to the city of Babylon and held them in what is known as the Babylonian captivity. It's during this time that the um, Hebrew people are going to develop a lot of their ideas that evolved into modern day Judaism. Now, eventually, the um, Hebrews were released by Cyrus the Great, who we've discussed already as this great kind of liberator of the region. And um, he released the um, Hebrews from captivity and they were able to go back to um, Jerusalem and establish their, uh, their um, control of that kingdom again. Um, that's why Cyrus the Great is referred to in the uh, Old Testament of the Bible. He's the only non-Jewish leader that is referred to as, the, as a Messiah, as a liberator you know, sent by God. So Cyrus the Great has a pretty good reputation, at least among the um, Egyptian, or excuse me, uh, among the Hebrew people of old. The, the ideas that the Jewish people developed, we've looked at a couple of these, um, developed in their ancient um, text, which is the Old Testament of the Bible or the Torah. Now, focus on this particularly because this section is, uh, is the essence of one of your writing questions on this unit test. The Torah or the Pentateuch or the books of Moses include the ancient history, early ancient history of the Jewish people. But in particular, they include the ideas that are referred to as Mosaic Law. And Mosaic Law is the law that was given to the Jewish people by their, um, uh, well, to, to Moses and to other Jewish leaders under the ideas that God was speaking directly to them during the time of the exodus out, out of Egypt. There is a major emphasis in Judaic, Judaic law about kind of an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, that concept that we've talked about before in Hammurabi's code. But the big difference in Jewish law is that we get developing this idea that is known as ethical monotheism. Because not just an eye for an eye is emphasized, but also the concept that people should be treated equally and with kindness um, because that's what God wants to take place. It's a strong contrast to other religions that were developing in the region at the time. As part of this concept of Mosaic Law, we of course get the essence of the law, which is the Ten Commandments, which you can see here. And these Ten Commandments set out very, very clearly the ideas that God wanted the Jewish people to act in a moral way, that you should not steal from people, you should not kill, you should treat people well, you should not lie, you should not want other people's possessions. And you should do these things because these are the ideas that God has created and that there is only one God that you should follow. 
So these concepts, which I'm going to skip through, you can go back and look at them, became kind of the central components of Jewish teachings. And all of this, as I said, is referred to as ethical monotheism. The concept that Yahweh or Jehovah or God is a God that demands kind of um, loving kindness, which is not an original concept as it begins, because originally in Judaism, God was seen as kind of a impassioned and jealous, jealous leader. But over time, the concept kind of evolves that God wants to have people treat people well into the more of this concept of a loving God. If you go back in the early books of the Old Testament, you'll see God is a pretty vengeful leader. He punishes people, for example, like with the flood or turning people into salt, like um, after not being, um, or the, his commands not being followed, um, pe uh, people being um, hurt badly. You have the stories of Job where you have God and Satan almost like playing with um, the um, individual known as Job to try to test his faith. But eventually you see more and more this concept of loving moral behavior. The other thing about God um, in the Jewish view, Hebrew Jewish view, is that God is a spiritual force, not just this powerful kind of glorified human being. All the other gods that you look at in the region were like, you know, like people. They had um, bad days. They had good days. They uh, were sometimes very vengeful. Sometimes they got very angry. Sometimes they could be very kind. It was all the things that humans could do, but just kind of elevated to a super powerful godlike status. The Jewish view is that God is a spirit. He is, cannot be understand understood. He cannot be controlled. Um, he is not affected by things the same way as man is affected. And so their ideas develop quite differently there. And also another difference is that they discuss this idea that humans were created by God and to serve him out of love, but they were not enslaved. They had free will, which if you remember, we mentioned I mentioned this about Zoroastrianism too. It's a concept that humans can choose to do what they want, but if they are good, they will choose to do the things that God wants to have done. So what's the impact of all this? These ideas that the Hebrews develop eventually became the key concept of religion in the Western world. This view of God as a moral, spiritual force is significant. Um, the idea of of having moral codes that God wanted you to follow to be a good person, and eventually the idea of legal codes like the Ten Commandments, which evolved into pretty much the basis of all the legal systems of the Western world. So a long, long-term impact that came out of Jewish religious beliefs, and all this concept of monotheism is an interesting idea that develops very clearly from ideas that were central to um, some of the civilizations of the Fertile Crescent region. That's it for this section.